In a lot of my content, I talk about using objective table tests or assessments to get an idea for where someone is. I want to know what the root cause of their limitations are. I want to know what their body is actually capable of doing and what I need to do to help them move and feel better. So you can do these anywhere. And if you're a coach, you can also do these either actively or passively. But we're going to talk about the active version of them today. Let's break down why these tests are actually important, what they're measuring. So, what I'm looking for when I'm assessing someone is how much relative movement someone's pelvis or hips are capable of. And there isn't a ton of movement in the pelvis itself. I'm going to be exaggerating it, but this very slight movement is necessary because this is what happens when we walk. We have the sacrum bone doing one thing and the innominate bones acting accordingly, or the inverse happens. The innominate bone moves and then the sacrum is going to respond according to that. When someone lacks this relative movement, what they actually end up doing most of the time is they just move their whole pelvis as an entire unit, whether that be side to side or forward or backward. But that doesn't mean that they're getting any of this happening within it. Now moving through orientation isn't necessarily a bad thing and it's really important for some context of movement, but when we break down the most basic fundamental human movement, which is gait or walking, we need some of this relative movement to happen. And if we don't, compensations build up very quickly. So we need to assess for how much relative movement this person is capable of. Let's begin with hip flexion. Hip flexion is measuring the relative motion of external rotation. Now, external rotation is when this bone flares out and this sacrum bone right here tips back. So on both sides of the pelvis, it would look like that but we're gonna be measuring this on one side because when we're walking, we're going to be dissociating from side to side. So what we're going to be measuring is the ability for the pelvis to go into external rotation, the sacrum to counter nutate, and also this femur right here going into external rotation. So if someone lays down on a table or the ground, what they're going to be doing from about zero to 60-ish degrees of hip flexion is that this innominate bone is going to be moving on the sacrum into external rotation like that. From 60 up to about 110-ish degrees, depending on the person and the shape of their pelvis, they are going to be in more of an internally rotated position of the femur and the pelvis relative to the zero to 60 degree position they were in previously. And then beyond 110 degrees, what we're going to see now is the need for the sacrum to turn towards this innominate bone, which is again, external rotation, but it's happening because the sacrum is now moving on the innominate bone. This is where people tend to get stuck and this occurs from about 110 to 120 degrees of hip flexion. The reason why so many people can't do this very effectively is because a lot of people have an anterior orientation of their pelvis where they are forward into this anterior pelvic tilt. If they are in this position, then they're not going to be able to do a couple of things. A, they're not going to be able to bring this femur back because it's going to get jammed on the acetabulum. There's no room for it to go into external rotation beyond about 110 degrees. And B, if a pelvis is forward in space like this, this orientation is usually because we're lacking some degree of internal rotation within our hips. So if I bring myself forward like this, then that is going to bias my femur towards more of a position of internal rotation, and I'm not going to be able to access as much external rotation and counter mutation, because for that to happen, the sacrum bone, remember, has to tip back, and this bone has to flare out. It's very challenging if we have an anteriorly oriented pelvis. When people are lacking this external rotation, they're going to compensate in a way for them to help find what they don't have. And this is moving through an orientation. Let's break down what that means. So if I need to bring this leg back and I can't do that very well, then I am going to be much more likely to roll my pelvis to that side because that allows me to pick up external rotation. External rotation is things away from the body, away from the midline. So if I roll to that side, that allows me to push my femur out more, and then I'm going to end up abducting my knee away from the midline of my body, and I'm also going to see the other leg come off of the floor. The other thing we're going to see is that people are going to just simply roll their pelvis underneath them. So let's say they're going back, 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 and they get stuck around 90 degrees like a lot of people do. They're going to end up rolling their pelvis underneath them, and you see how that can give me more hip flexion, but it's not because I'm getting external rotation here. I'm just 
just orienting my pelvis underneath myself. And this is someone who usually has an anterior orientation. So hip flexion was an external rotation measurement. The other one we're gonna be looking at is a straight leg raise, which is an internal rotation assessment. And I know that people traditionally look at a straight leg raise as a hamstring flexibility test, but that's not necessarily the full picture. In a straight leg raise, the difference is now that we're keeping the leg locked out, and it needs to stay locked out through the duration of the straight leg raise. What this is going to do is create an internal rotation bias of my femur. This is called the screw home mechanism. When we lock out our knee, what we're going to see is the femur internally rotate and the tibia relatively externally rotate. That allows us to lock out the knee. So what's gonna happen here is we're going to have an earlier need for internal rotation because of this screw home mechanism. What we're going to see from about zero to 45 degrees is more of an external rotation bias. If someone cannot get beyond 45 degrees, that is the point at which we need to really move into internal rotation. Internal rotation looks like this anominate bone moving away from the sacrum, again, exaggerated, and then the sacrum moving into nutation on that side. From the back, it looks like this is opening up right here. If they can't do that, then they're probably going to get stuck before or at 45 degrees. Now remember hip flexion, we roll towards it because that allows us to access external rotation, which is out there away from the midline of the body. On this, for a need for internal rotation, we're gonna see ourselves roll away from it because that is what's going to allow us to access that internal rotation through an orientation rather than the relative movement. In many cases, we can literally just see the legs start to drift out to the side. What we'll also see sometimes is someone just, again, roll their pelvis underneath them. Either way, you're going to see some movement on this other femur right here, and that's going to be a big indication that they are orienting their pelvis to find what they don't have. So if someone gets stuck below 45 degrees, then they usually have compression of the backside of their pelvis. Something in here is tight, usually deep hip external rotators, which is preventing the ability for this space to open up and this leg to go into internal rotation and this anominate bone as well. The best thing is these tests usually have relationships to one another. So if I saw someone that had a lot of extension tone and they had 90 degrees of hip flexion, then I would expect their shoulder flexion to also be around 90 degrees because they're not gonna be able to get that scapula to move away from the spine and upwardly rotate because they have that back extension tone. If you're curious to learn more, I have a free webinar that's available to anyone. It goes much more in detail of how these tests relate to each other and what assessment measurements you would specifically see in certain layers of compensation and also some exercises that'll help you peel back those layers of compensation and objectively improve these assessment results instantly. Check it out, it's down below, it's free for anyone and it will give you much more detail in terms of the things I'm discussing here today.